Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to this public hearing of the New York City Rent Guidelines Board. This is the fifth of five public hearings to consider comments concerning proposed rent adjustments for renewal leases for apartments, lofts, hotels, and other housing units subject to the Rent Stabilization Law of 1969 and the Emergency Tenant Protection Act of 1974. These adjustments will affect renewal leases commencing between October 1, 2016 through September 30th, 2017. I will now take roll call. Please respond if present. Harvey Epstein. He's here, but not, oh, there he, okay. <laughs> Stephen Flax, Shayla Garcia, Cecilia Hosa, Sabiel Ramani, present. Helen Chow, present. Mary Serafi, Scott Walsh, Kathleen Roberts, that's me and I'm here. Let the record show that we have a quorum. The next meeting of the board will be the final vote, which is scheduled to take place on June 27th, starting at 6.30 p.m. It will be held in the Great Hall at Cooper Union, 7 East 7th Street, at the corner of 3rd Avenue in Manhattan. Directions to this meeting can be found on our website, nycrgb.org, in the About Us section, meeting schedule. And as always, there are copies of our meeting schedule here today. To board members, please note that drafts of both the hotel and apartment explanatory statements are in your folders. Uh, they're not? Okay. No. We have previously been provided to you. Uh, it, we request your comments uh, and or suggested additions to the statements no later than the morning of June 24th. Revised drafts will be sent to you via email by Wednesday, June 22nd, reflecting additions resulting from the public hearings. Any questions, please see Andrew. All right, before um, we begin our hearing, I would like to read some of the rules and parameters for those who are testifying before the board. Each speaker will have two minutes to give his or her testimony. In the event that large numbers of people wish to speak, the chair reserves the right to reduce the allotted speaking time. The clock will beep once when the speaker has 30 seconds left. I will attempt to alternate speakers between tenants and owners, but this may not always be possible. Uh, speakers must confirm their presence with the RGB staff at the registration table located near the entrance of the hall. Speakers will not be called if they have not checked in at the registration table. Uh, tonight we have a Spanish interpreter. When registering to speak, please notify the staff if you would like an interpreter. I will try to call several names in advance. If your name is called, it's advisable that you move toward the front of the auditorium. If you have materials to distribute to the board, you should give them to the RGB staff sitting at the sign-in table near the entrance. And we ask you please to try to stay within your allotted time so that we can get through as many speakers as possible. At this time, I'll ask our interpreter to um, uh, interpret what I've just read to the group. Anuncios para las guías de el atletismo de las guías para la audiencia pública, eh, para la audiencia del público y cómo se va a comenzar la reunión. La presidencia quiere dar la bienvenida a todas las personas en la audiencia de Nueva York en las directrices de la Junta de Renta. Esta es el, la quinta audiencia pública que queremos considerar los comentarios concernientes a los ajustes de rentas para la renovación de arrendamiento y contrato de apartamentos, hoteles y casas que y sujet, están sujetos a la, estabilización, la, la ley de estabilización de 1969 y la, la ley de protección de emergencia para inquilinos de 1974. Estos ajustes estarán en efecto para renovar los contratos de arrendamiento empezando de octubre 1 de 2016 hasta septiembre 30 de 2017. En nuestra próxima reunión de la Junta se hará el último voto que va a llevarse a cabo en el 27 y empieza a las 6 y media. Esto se va a llevar a cabo en el Grey Hall de Cooper Union en el 7 de, eh, este de la calle 7 en la esquina de la tercera avenida en Manhattan. Direcciones para esta reunión se pueden encontrar en nuestra página de web 
y toda información sobre esta sección y también el itinerario de esta reunión. Y como siempre, hay copias de estas reuniones que están en el itinerario aquí en el día de hoy. Antes de comenzar esta audiencia, quiero leer algunos de los reglamentos y parámetros para estas personas que están testificando ante la Junta. Cada eh, orador tendrá dos minutos para dar su testimonio. En el evento que hay un número muy grande de personas que quieren hablar, la presidencia se reserva el derecho a reducir el tiempo permitido para hablar. El reloj va a hacer un sonido una vez estén cerca de los 30 segundos. La presidencia va a intentar que se alternen los oradores entre personas que son inquilinos y caseros, pero esto no siempre es posible. Los oradores deben confirmar su presencia con el personal de la Junta de Directrices y la Registración en la Mesa de Registración que está en la parte trasera de la sala. Oradores no pueden ser llamados si no han sido inscritos en la registración, en la Mesa de Registración. Cuando se registre para hablar, por favor, notifique si necesita un intérprete. La presidencia también va a llamar a unos cuantos nombres y su nombre es llamado, por favor, muévase hacia el frente del auditorio. Si tiene algún material a distribuir, la Junta, para la Junta, por favor, déselo al personal de RGB que está sentado en la parte trasera en la mesa de registración. La Junta le pregunta, pide por favor que se mantenga en su tiempo permitido para que podamos llegar a tantos programas como podamos. Thank you. Our first speaker will be Scott Stringer, the controller of the City of New York. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Roberts and distinguished members of the board for the opportunity to testify at this important public hearing. And I'm actually very glad to be speaking here in the heart of Harlem. For years, tenant advocates have pressed for an uptown hearing because working people shouldn't have to go downtown and have their voices heard. So I commend the RGB for answering this call. And I think everyone appreciates that you're here tonight. So would you give them a big round of applause? Red regulation is a lifeline to New Yorkers who are struggling to make ends meet. It's one of the central pillars of our affordable housing stock, spanning one million units of affordable housing across five boroughs. And now more than ever, at a time when more than 57,000 New Yorkers are homeless, we've got to keep this precious resource affordable. Tonight, 57,000 people will sleep in a shelter. 23,000 are children. So tonight, I want to talk to you as the city's chief financial officer and look at some numbers. And the numbers this year are very clear. From 2013 to 2014, net operating income from 3.5%. 10th consecutive year, income has increased for building owners. Meanwhile, cost to operate rent stabilized buildings went down, led by a staggering 41% drop in fuel costs. At the same time, one third of city residents are paying more than half of their hard earned wages towards rent every single month. It all adds up to one simple conclusion. This board should vote for another rent freeze. Some of us remember in 2008 when building owners warned of rising fuel costs and convinced the board at that time to push through big rent increases. This year, fuel costs have plummeted, so it would seem only right that the same logic should apply and the tenants share the cost of savings this year by at least staying even. Our city is investing billions of dollars to build new affordable housing, but it will be years before those new units are online. New Yorkers need immediate relief, and this board can provide immediate relief again to thousands of New York families right now. So I urge you to make history again and vote for rent freeze and send a message that New York City is doing everything in its power to build an affordable future for our city. I'm, I'm going to submit, in the interest of time, a more in-depth testimony and some numbers that reflect some of our uh, examination. Thank you. We have copies of that. You have right? We do. Right. Well, thank you very much for giving this opportunity. Thank you. Let me just ask if there are any questions for the controller. Thank you very much, Controller. I really appreciate you coming and supporting a rent freeze this year. And what would you say to those owners that we hear? We've heard maybe a half dozen to a dozen small property owners saying, you know, it's destructive to the housing stock. And, you know, what do you say in response to them who say, well, rent freeze is not a good thing for the city? 
Peak prices are, are at a 10 year low. And since 1994, New York City has lost at least 151,001 rent regulated apartments. 8,049 units were deregulated in 2015 alone under high rent vacancy deregulation of 29% from the previous year. We had an affordable housing crisis. When I became controller, I think the first economic an uh, analysis I did was to look at the housing stock. And what we found was something very frightening. Over a 12-year period, we've lost 400,000 apartments that used to rent for $1,000 or less. In that same time, we've seen a homeless explosion. And many of you who have expertise in this field know it is not easy to build affordable housing. It's very costly, it's problematic. And look at the challenge the mayor is facing with his affordable housing plan. It takes a lot to do this. So it makes sense to preserve the housing we have, especially when the numbers dictate that. One of the things that we hear from owners in particular is that uh, at the same time that they are being asked to hold the line, so to speak, in terms of the rent that they're collecting, that um, property taxes are going up astronomically. And I think virtually every owner we heard from expressed the view that the city, on the one hand, is asking them to bear the responsibility for maintaining affordable housing, and at the same time, is not giving them any tax relief um, from rising tax uh, assessments, essentially. We are, we are not here, and I certainly, you know, part of this testimony every year uh, let, is sort of the tenant versus the landlord. But look, I think small property owners are struggling in many of our communities as well. That doesn't mean that we should punish the people who live in their buildings. But if they want to open their books and start sharing their information, I would be the first to sit down with a magnifying glass and take a look at it. But they don't open their books. And we have to open our data points with the tenants who are behind me tonight. And I can tell you very clearly, if the numbers say we have reduced costs, that it makes sense just to hold the line. That's what, that's what we're saying. There's been no indication overall that you're seeing tremendous increases. But we have seen, prior to this administration, we have seen increases that perhaps were too high when numbers suggested otherwise. So this is a real opportunity to keep the status quo. Let's see where the economy is a year from now. We do know that we have a housing crisis in the city and we're losing rent regulated apartments. Albany doesn't help. We're on our own when it comes to this. And I'm here tonight to tell you that if you walk around this community, and many of you have, you can see a community where people invested their sweat equity in the community, and now we're seeing luxury development, and the people who built the community, they're hanging on in their rent regulated or rent controlled apartments, and they can barely make ends meet. And we want a city for everybody, and this tonight is an important vote or a discussion we're having. Thank you. Any other questions for the controller? And what do you think it says to the city for us to rent, you know, for a rent freeze? I'm sorry, say again? What, oh. to vote for a red freeze. No, what message are we sending here if we vote for a red freeze? What message are we sending to the tenants out there? What, what you're saying is you recognize that your vote reflects the numbers that have been presented, especially related to field costs. You are doing your due diligence in terms of trying to strike the right balance. And I believe after our analysis in my office shows that this is a time when we can afford not to raise the rent. Look, there may come a point, the city, you know, the city economy never stays the way it is. Something happens, and there may be a call to have a higher rent increase. And the tenants will have to bear that burden as they always have. But we are at a point in time where fortunately the data suggests that the landlords are making a profit. There is a process that the RGB the RGB, RGB engages in, and I think this would send a message of fairness, level-headedness, and, and some sanity in this process. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, 
And I got, I got a gift from you, the whole thing. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, our first three speakers will be William Gooden, James Jones, and Mika Lasher. So first, William Gooden. Good evening, Mr. Gooden. Good evening, and thank you very much to the board for giving me an opportunity. So you'll need to lift the mic up close to your mouth, please. Is that better? You can t just, yes. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with the board tonight. I represent the Riverside Edgecombe Neighborhood Group, and I come today to ask the board in the name of the humanities and all that is compassion regarding human life, that you offer not a rent freeze, but a rent reduction. Are you aware that there are many of us who did not get the rent freeze this year? The landlord did not allow it, so we still don't have any uh, reduction or any uh, relief on our rent. And a few months ago, I attended a real estate investors forum here in New York, and the guest speaker was the CEO of Blackstone, who recently purchased Stuyvesant Town. And in his speech there, he stated that New York City landlords are laughing at us, the tenants. He thinks that the rental market in New York is the biggest Ponzi scheme of all. In New York, life is very bleak for us right now. If you've spoken with friends or acquaintances of late, you hear there's a mass exodus of the middle class leaving New York. Policemen, firemen, school teachers, hospital workers, salespeople, even General Motors and IBM have closed shop in New York. They're looking for states that offer better affordable rates for housing, cities that will allow their employees to work and live there. In New York, life is very bleak right now. The average income, the rent is $2,000, $3,000 a month. The maximum unemployment compensation is $1,900. The maximum Social Security benefit retirement is $2,000. So if you have a $2,000 or $3,000 rent, you are really in trouble if you get sick, if you become unemployed, or if you are a senior, you could be facing eviction within two months. I myself personally, I live in an apartment that was 10 years ago, the rent was $638 in 2006. Today, the rent is $2,000. And I'm asking the board for a $500 reduction on that rent because that would have exceeded $1,000 raised in the last 10 years. And I think if the landlord could get a 50% increase off that rent in the past 10 years, and the tenant could get a 50% reduction off the legal rent now, we all be in a better place. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Griffin? No, no questions. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Jones. Norman Siegel, Norman Siegel, at CCRPB meeting, Frank Rowe, WOHL, Chairman, Rowe, indicate police provide bread and butter for district attorney. District attorney, indicate police does not provide bread and butter for district attorney. Corporation Council, knock on all tenant doors. Advice, put developer off property. Introduce Mr. Reed, Mr. Reed, Building Administration. Building Administration. Developer runs the Chinese man bankruptcy director. Developer tells China man bankruptcy director. Third tenant voting back. No vote occur. Developer raises the attack. Plumbing contractor on job. Plumbing contractor hired and paid by New York City government. CCRB sends Jones back to Corporation Council. Reader Dumain, Corporation Council officer, indicates summary, summary, summary is not a mistake. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Mika Lasher, Micah, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing it. What's the correct pronunciation? Micah, thank you. Good evening, my name is Micah Lasher. 
Most recently, I served as Chief of Staff to the New York State Attorney General, but I testify here in my personal capacity as a candidate for State Senate in the 31st District, which is home to more rent-regulated apartments than any other district in the state. These homes and the affordability of our neighborhoods are under threat now more than ever. We have hemorrhaged rent-regulated housing as a result of vacancy deregulation, the eviction bonus, and other provisions of law enacted at the behest of landlords. Tenants are being harassed out of their homes by unscrupulous landlords, some of whom we prosecuted in the Attorney General's office, and they are being priced out of their homes because of the chronic and severe housing shortage that persists and which is your responsibility to mitigate. As former Rent Guidelines Board Executive Director Timothy Collins has detailed, the Board has, over the last two decades, dramatically overcompensated landlords. Even allowing for profits to go up with inflation, RGB increases exceeded what was necessary to keep owners whole by 52%. This unjustified wealth transfer handed windfall profits to landlords without even pausing to correct for overstated cost projections. You can begin to address this now and should respectfully feel obligated to do so. A rent rollback of 2% for two-year leases and 4% for one-year leases would move the ratio of landlord's costs to income to just under 64%. That is where it covered from 2005 to 2011. This is not a radical proposal, it is merely fair. In 2015, landlord's profits, as calculated by that ratio, hit a 12-year high. Also at a record high is our homeless population. What kind of city allows this? We should all ask that question as a moral matter, but you need not answer it to justify a rent rollback. You need only look at the numbers. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Let's see if we have any questions. Any questions for the speaker? No questions. Thank you. The next three speakers will be Catherine Nixon, Graham Saralo, and Vajra Kilgore. <laughs> Does the mic come out? Could she sit down? Okay. I'll ask her. And Ms. Nixon, would you prefer to sit while you testify? Because the mic can come out of the holder. You should hold it. Here's the lesson for the people. June 21st. Could you speak into the microphone, please? My name is Catherine Nell Nixon. I'm a World War I baby. Father was in World War I, was called the Harlem Hellfighters, the 369th. I am in the documentary of the Harlem Hellfighters. Speaking in behalf of veterans and veterans' families, the federal government owes veterans and veterans families for the terrible treatment they received when they came home. My father passed away when I was three years old. Our family was put out on the street almost every month because my mother's pension check did not come regularly. It came any time of the month from the first to the 31st. We were dispossessed. All the laws were put out on the sidewalk. No such thing as a housing court. The nightmare went on for almost 30 or 40 years. Through God's mercy and church and family, my two brothers survived, who were in the military also, now deceased. I am a widow of a Marine veteran. After housing court came into existence, I have been in court, not for any fault of mine, but because the landlord had violation. The rent was reduced. The landlord took it to court and was granted to, that he get the money back. But some tenants moved out. I stayed and fought. 
I quit my rent aside for three years. I was in housing court. Finally, I won and stayed and paid my rent. Today, this family has the opportunity to do the right thing. This for the tenants who have been struggling in financially, physically, and in a mental nightmare. Do the right thing for the tenants. Sincerely, Captain the Great. I'm 95 years old. <laughs> Thank you. Tough to follow up. Um, <laughs> good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, hi, my name is Graham Sorallo. I am a resident uh, in Woodland. I am a rent stabilized tenant, and uh, I didn't really expect to be speaking tonight, so uh, I don't have anything formal. Um, basically, I just want to speak to encourage you to uh, vote for a rent rollback. Uh, my neighbors and I have been rent building for years, and it's been extremely difficult. Um, I don't have kids. So uh, my neighbors, some ones that have kids, two, three kids, I don't know how they do it. Um, if ever there was a time, and from what, hearing, well, from what I'm hearing, from what Mr. Stringer said, and from what others, have, uh, what others have said, if there's any time to do a rent rollback, if there's any time that you could give us some relief, this is the time to do it. And I'm asking you to please, please consider that. Um, I don't have much more to say. You know, you know what's going on in the city. Uh, so please, consider that right now. Thank you, Mr. Salala. Vajra Kukur. Did I pronounce that correctly? My name is, my name is Vajra Kilgower. Kilgower? Yes. Um, uh, Scott Stringer really mentioned a figure of 57,000 people in homeless shelters. I checked on the web yesterday, it was 60,000. Oh, 60,000. I'm sure you've heard some testimony from landlords. I don't know if you've heard of a single landlord in a homeless shelter because that person can't afford to meet their shelter costs. Not one. There may be a difference of 3,000 between what Scott Springer says and what I say. 3,000 human beings, more or less. That's already outrageous if there were 3,000. 23,000 of the children, and I'm sure you know something about the traumatic effect of homelessness on children. We're in the process of the healing. Could you please respect the speaker? Go ahead. We'll make it up. Thanks. The traumatic effect on children of homelessness, I'm sure some of you have some awareness of. And that homelessness is a direct result of steadily rising rents in regulated apartments over the last 20, 30 years. Homelessness has skyrocketed as a result. And every single year, people would come and say, there would be more homelessness if you raise rents. And, they, and rents would be raised, and there's more homelessness. Now, I'm here in part because I see my neighborhood disappearing before my eyes. I have neighbors who, if there is not a rent roll back, they've lived in the same place for 35 years, and you may be aware that part of the purpose of rent stabilization was to stabilize neighborhoods. They will have to move out. The apartment will be completely renovated. It will be taken out of rent stabilization. It will then be rented to three or four students who have no commitment to the community who will be gone and who are not necessarily wonderfully behaved as a result of having no commitment to the community. So we're seeing our community be destroyed. At the same time that the landlord, by taking those units out of rent stabilization, is making unprecedented profits. He doesn't need a raise from us. We need a rollback. The people of New York City need a rollback whose rent increases have gotten to the place where it is absolutely destroying the supply of affordable housing in New York. Because once a rent stabilized tenant moves out, that unit is almost invariably gone. And one last thing, if I can have a fair word, because this was an introduction. Those landlords who claim that they're having a problem can open their books. They have no problem doing the paperwork to get an MCI. They can certainly do the paperwork to open their books. There is no reason, there is no other business where a failing, a person who is failing in their business is rewarded at the expense of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of other human beings being punished, having to pay for the failure of a few. You must know the vast majority of landlords are the largest corporations, and they trot out their few that are struggling. They actually have recourse. The tenants have none. And on the basis of all of us help these poor struggling landlords, 
tenants. 60,000 people in normal shelters, 23,000 children in normal shelters. What does that do to their lives? What are you doing? This is like crazy social engineering. So please, a roll back. We need a roll back. Thank you. Ben Collins. Caleb's son. Good evening, Councilman. Good evening. Thank you for having me here again. Thank you for doing this event in Upper Manhattan. I think one quick thing, if you could just say for the record, for the security in back, that this is a public meeting. Recording devices are allowed. If you could let them know so that they will let folks record uh, this public event. Oh, well, I'll send someone back to speak to him. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, tonight, I am here in my, in, in my capacity as a councilman, but as vice chair of the Progressive Caucus, which supports a red rollback. In addition, I'm here on behalf of 20 other council members, including council members Rosenthal, Cumbo, Reynoso, Chin, Lander, Drum, Barabnik, Rose, Richards, Menchaca, Levin, Levine, Mendez, Gentile, Johnson, Gibson, Miller, Van Bramer, Rodriguez, Eugene, and more. We will be submitting those letters, which you should have. And we wanted to thank you for holding this hearing in all four boroughs, including Upper Manhattan. Both tenants and landlords shared their personal experiences of trying to stay in their homes, keeping their units both affordable and popular. In the past, rank guidelines board gave far more attention to landlords' costs than to tenants' ability to pay. The board estimated landlords' fixed costs and voted for rent increases that far outstrip the growth of the local economy. The board's good work over the past two years has begun to address the issues, but is there more to do? And this year, uh, we're asking for a fair balance for tenants and landlords, which means a rent roll back. When compared to the data from the Department of Finance reported by landlords themselves, the price index of operating costs, the PIOC, actually overstated landlords' costs by 11% since 2005, so this negative PIOC is still an underestimation, and landlords' costs are even lower than the already negative 1.2% suggest. These are excerpts from the letter. The board has also received data showing that the net operating income for landlords has increased for the 10th year in a row. Rental income for landlords rose by 4.8%, and total income for landlords rose by 4.9%. All these data points show that the rent rollback is feasible warranted, logical, and fair. I am just trying to summarize the uh, points. Uh, the Rent Guidelines Board must have been in favor of the Red Roadblock. Since the market crash in 2008, tenants faced an average yearly increase of 3.1%, while the average national asking rent increase during the period was only 0.6%. Furthermore, we are suffering from the highest rent burdens ever recorded. The median amount of rent paid by stabilized tenants has increased to 36.4% of household income. In 2014 alone, average rent collections in stabilized buildings rose by 3.5%. This unbearable rent burden leads to tenant displacement, as we saw 221,988 evictions and possessions in 2015. 43% were evictions of rent stabilized tenants. These numbers are not sustainable and bring you up to the verge of being an exorbitant we price city. We, the preceding members of the city council, share the mayor's goal to preserve 120,000 units of affordable housing over the next decade. In order to achieve this goal, significant actions must be taken to protect tenants, to direct, of course, the city's rent stabilization program, and to preserve as many units of affordable housing as possible. We implore you to vote for a rent roll back on June 27, 2016. Thank you for allowing me overage to speak on behalf of 21 council members, including myself. Happy to take any questions if there are any. Let's see if there are any questions. Any questions? There was a question. Yeah, I just, so we've heard from, from about a half dozen to a dozen small property owners who say, you know, what a rent rollback will do will, you know, destroy my building, I will make my livelihood. What do you say to an owner who makes those allegations and what do you say to the city about you know, what the city and the city's future is about in relationship to supporting rent rollback. Sure, I was just going to consult an email from my uh, uh, landlord-tenant lawyer that I uh, work with for 
from the Urban uh, Justice Center. Uh, and in fact, many of the council members uh, that you know have clinics with the Urban Justice Center where you are facing uh, tough situations with your landlord. So uh, if a landlord has a problem, uh, they can apply for a hardship increase from, this, uh, from DHCR. They can uh, get a low interest loan from HPD. Uh, or they can enter into regulatory agreements with HPD and even get tax abatements. That being said, as an elected official, I've had new construction ask for tax abatements in the form of 421A, J51, and others. And I've had some other new construction. But I've never had a rent stabilized owner, and I have over 29,000 units, come to my district office, tell me that they weren't able to make enough money and ask for my support in seeking funding from HPD. Uh, it just hasn't happened. Uh, that being said, I think uh, to the extent that you find something particularly compelling from a landlord, uh, if they've engaged in this process and they say yes, they should release that information so you can actually see what's going on. Uh, and I'm actually, I, I, it's, it, I'm not used to being on this side of the uh, hearing. Uh, but I'm curious to learn from HPD how many landlords who are here asking for a, a rent increase uh, have actually taken advantage of the DHCR HPD programs. Uh, I, I do know we've set aside so much money in the council to support landlords who do want to put forward affordable housing. Just so you know, on the DHCR process, Zero loans applied for a hard to increase in 2015. Uh, thank you, and we are lucky to have you and so many of the other members and your expertise uh, on the Red Guidelines Board. Thank you. Could you oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Sylvia? Yeah, Councilmember. Yeah, Councilmember, could you, uh, you alluded to this a little bit before, but could you just uh, outline for us uh, from the City Council's perspective, you know, we, we're we hearing a lot of testimony. We uh, have a, a fairly narrow slice uh, of, you know, what the board can do. Uh, could you just elaborate a little bit from the City Council's perspective? What are the major uh, measures that you see would be complementing what the board might do to deal with the uh, affordability challenge? We just passed uh, the most broad staking uh, mandatory inclusionary housing program in the country. Any rezoning moving forward will create more rent stabilized units throughout the city. And we will need to work in partnership with the Rent Guidelines Board so that as we create new affordable housing, we need to create 180,000 new units in the next 10 years under the mayor's mandate. Uh, we will need to make sure that the Rent Guidelines Board uh, continues to keep the rents uh, affordable. Uh, otherwise, if we continue to see rents increases that outpace inflation and uh, income increases throughout the population, then all that affordable housing will no longer be affordable to anyone. So it is a clear partnership. You have a strong power over rents in rent stabilized housing, which will be a result of MIH. So we, it is a partnership, and we thank you. Any other questions? What do you think? Sure. Is, thank you. What do you think is our responsibility as a board to be able to maintain those uh, those new that new construction and the current talk of rent stabilized units we have? Rent uh, That's that's the, the quick answer. Uh, from 2005 through 2013, uh, the rent increases outpaced inflation. Uh, I, I was disappointed to see a vote for a rent freeze earlier, and that is a vote that is not binding. Uh, the the PIAC is actually a negative issue. Rents, uh, landlords are reporting 4.5% and above increases in profits. This is the year for a rent rollback, uh, so that uh, tenants can afford to live here. And even with that rent rollback, I'll be here next year asking for another rent rollback and a rent freeze until we achieve parity. I think according to the number from the testimony I submitted to you, uh, you the rent guidelines for previous increases before this rent guidelines board is currently constituted outpaced inflation by about 17%, which comes out to about $1,500 more a year in rent that folks could be spending on medication, food, or even education. That's about the same price as going to CUNY uh, and getting a higher degree and being able to do anything you want with your life. Thank you very much for having me. Thank, Thank you. you for coming out today. <clears throat> the next three speakers will be Daniel Carpin, Abraham Musaf, and uh, Desenia Glover.
Daniel Carpen. My name is Daniel Carpen, K-A-R-P-E-N. I reside at Free Harbor Hill Drive, Huntington, New York. I own my own house. I'm a professional engineer, and I specialize in energy conservation engineering. I didn't bring it today, but I do have a case study of a landlord with six units in Queens. He had an inefficient steam heating system that was banging and costing him a lot of money. It was costing him $13,000 a year for heat and hot water in this six unit building. He hired me as an energy conservation engineer to cut costs. We took out a 400,000 BTU steam boiler and put in one that was generating only 80,000 BTU steam because the windows had been upgraded so the boiler was terribly energy inefficient. Then we put in a separate domestic hot water heater fueled by natural gas where the condensing units are incredibly efficient. He cut his costs from $13,000 a year down to $3,000 a year. He got his money back in two years, which is extraordinary return on investment in energy conservation engineering. On Wednesday, there's going to be hearings before the city council on changing the state city energy conservation construction code. Unfortunately, those hearings do not address the replacement of old, inefficient, oversized boilers with more efficient equipment, the requirements to downsize boilers for new installations are not in the code that's being considered by the City Council. I applied to the Builders Department to be on the committee to revise the code. They rejected me. Then, I applied to the Builders Department on the Free Information Law for a list of those people who were on supposedly in the committee. I was told I couldn't get the list, they never supplied it to me. Moreover, when I tried to attend these meetings as an observer sitting back, they refused to allow me to do so. I consider that an incredible abuse of power by the Buildings Department. Thank you. Do you have any questions of me? No questions. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Abraham Musa. Yes, my name is Abraham Musa, and I'm a small local in Armstrong and a big town west. I don't know where those politicians and uh, council people come with those crazy numbers that they have to go back to them. And the proof here, from last year, my tax was $72,000. This year, went up to $84,000. And the reason it went up, because I have two tenants that passed away, they should rest in peace. Went to two old ladies that lived like 67 years in the building. I had no problem with them. They pay very, very, very well. Very. So my hand got very well. Then they went up to $20,000. My tax went up to $12,000. So I guess this is maybe one and a half percent. I guess the uh, $12,500 went up from $20,000 I gave. So this is probably my, my computation is high. It's one and a half percent. Right? That's the increase in taxes from 70 to 84. I'll give you this. This is really good. Don't look at it. My, my insurance. Okay? I'll give you the insurance. The insurance. 2013 was 13,000. 2014 was 14,000. 2014, whatever, 22,000. Last year, 29. This year, 40,000 dollars. So what is the This is 2%? I don't understand. From the year before, was $13,000, 4 or 5 years before. Now it's $40,000. And I have right to feel, I would like to show it to you, please. And look at it, and go right back home. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, I feel better than people here. 
what was standing here. They deserve the bread, they deserve anything wrong, but held by the government, but not on the back of the landlord. The landlord is any other enterprise like anything else, like supermarket, store, any store, hospital, everybody there work on target to make money. I work 17, 18 hours a day, I work 7 days a week if I need to, and I do that, I put a lot of time. You don't see my, any one of my tenants come and complain, and I can give you a list of my tenants, you can go any of my tenants, whatever it is, they then get it done immediately. The same day, the next day. I put them, I give them the best services possible. And I don't care if they pay $100 or they pay $1,000. Doesn't make any no sense. These people should deserve a break. They burn this country, they work hard, everything else, fine. But the government should help. They should not put all that burden on the government. Simple as that. Thank you. Let's see if there are any questions. You had a question? Yeah, I, I do appreciate you coming to testify. And I, it sounds like you know, you're a really good landlord and your tenants do well. But I just want to make sure you're saying, are your, do your, does your income exceed your expenses each fiscal year? Which could be two year for you? No, no, my income exceeds my expenses, yes. But if I, I'm deserved to make money out of this, first of all, the investment, the second of I could place hours to keep maintain the building in perfect shape. You understand? But I just had a problem with the building, I put $80,000 because the team was set. You have to really trust the building from the basis, or you can just go through the steel structure and enforce it. Well, I do appreciate you putting the money and time into the building, and I'm glad your income exceeds your expenses. But there are programs available through HPD. I just have a problem with the expenses. I never went to the government help. I'm just saying, if you do need support, there's ways to to get additional support. So like you're saying, like if you feel like like there are millions of tenants who you know need a rent freeze or a rent rollback, if you feel like that doesn't work for your building, there are programs available to assist you as a small property owner. Okay, now you see my 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 insurance bill is four thousand dollars. I don't have the money to pay for I have maybe ten thousand dollars. I'm waiting for the next time to maybe I'll make it. But yeah. then it might suffer all over the place. By the end of the year, I may be really a couple of bucks. Then you can pay for my investment, the time I put in, this is nothing. Well, then you can apply for a hardship increase at the HCR. I mean, so you should, there's, a, there's a process available to you, just so you know that if you want to apply for a hardship, if you, if you, don't, you don't feel like you're making good enough return, you can, you can apply at HCR for a hardship increase, which will help you. And I understand your problem, and we're concerned about you, but we're also concerned about the millions of tenants and the 50,000 57,000 homeless individuals I understand. to get the balance that out. I understand that. I just saw him in the newspaper today. They found a fraud from the medical fraud. $187 million people were cycling out because of the medical fraud. This $187,000 could help people here that they need help. And there is, I'm pretty sure there's other fraud happening here and something is going under the radar and nobody catches it. Yeah. Unfortunately, we only control the rent increases for the rent guidelines board, and we have a system in Albany that's really dysfunctional, and we can't get good laws passed in Albany. But this is something that will be concrete for millions of tenants in New York City. Okay. Thank you very much. The Senator Gordon. Good evening. Good evening, Ms. Hopper. Thank you uh, for having us here in Uptown and Harlem. Uh, next year, we're going to pack this room. Uh, my name is Elsie Yellow. I'm here on behalf of tenants and neighbors in the Alliance of Tenant Power. On behalf of the tenants we serve and support, I'm here to request that the state rights tenants receive a rent bill back this year. Last year, this board made history with a 0% increase for one year leases. Let's make bigger history and do the right thing with the rent bill back. There are 2.5 million rent stabilized tenants living in approximately 1 million apartments in New York City. I do not have to tell you that tenants are heavily rent burdened. You've seen the statistics. In communities like East, Central, West Park, and Washington Heights, that burden is even more pronounced. During the 12 long years of the previous administration, tenants received increases that were way out of line with the price index of operating costs, which amounted to a complete landlord giveaway. As you heard before, at the height of the recession, tenants received an 8.5% increase on two-year leases, which was way out of line. 
As my friend Paul Lennon said at the Bronx hearing last week, we don't mind landlords making a profit, but we do mind them making a killing, which is what happened over the 12 long years of the former mayor. This year, the payout is negative. The notion that landlords are not making enough money to operate their buildings as well as receive a profit is ludicrous. If that were the case, they would, as any rational person would, stop investing in the purchasing money. Additionally, 28% of all regulated tenants have preferential rents. And what I have been seeing as a tenant association president uh, happening this year and last year is that when preferential rent tenants receive their new leases, they are seeing increases of up to 10%. This means that landlords are getting their money. At Tenants and Neighbors, we get calls constantly from tenants seeking information about how to fight MCIs. As landlords with Prince State Lights Building, some recently purchased, begin a process of revamping with major capital improvements, in many cases where the building infrastructures have been neglected for years and then charged tenants for it. These MCIs become permanent and tenants rent, which means that average 6% increase is added in each year. This is unconscionable. Further, and I'm almost done, according to a recent study by the Community Service Society, making the rent of the 83 million in inflation adjusted increases from 2011 to 2014, rent guidelines would increase accounted for 25%. 48% came from vacancy bonuses, 10% during occupancy, which is MCIs, and 14% from other increases during vacancy. I know the rent laws, and I, I know the rent laws, and I am clear that you have nothing to do with MCIs, vacancy bonuses, or preferential rents, except that landlords are getting their money in multiple ways, tenant incomes are stagnant, and you have the power to make this right. We ask for a right roll back. Thank you. The next three speakers are Betsy Eichel, Elaine Williams, and Robert Desir. Betsy Eichel. Good evening. Uh, my name is Betsy Eichel, and I'm a tenant organizer at Housing Conservation Coordinators. I work with many tenants who are struggling to remain in their apartments in neighborhoods that are no longer affordable to anyone who's not wealthy. These tenants are artists, teachers, social workers, seniors, immigrants, and members of the LGBTQ community. They have contributed enormously to their neighborhoods. But rec regulated tenants on the Upper West Side, Hell's Kitchen, and Chelsea, and Harlem, of course, face numerous pressures. Rents have increased dramatically over the years while wages have remained stagnant. Predatory limited liability corporations and private equity firms are buying buildings from far beyond what the current rent will can sustain, creating a twisted incentive to get lower paid tenants out. Landlords are getting more creative in their methods of harassment. Tenants who could not make it to testify encouraged me to share their experiences of how rent increases and harassment have impacted their lives. One tenant told me about the years that he and his rent stabilized neighbors lived in a quote construction site while the vacant units were converted into condos. Those condos are now often rented to tourists on Airbnb, which makes the long-term tenants feel unsafe and means that the stress they went through is not even resulting in more long-term housing. In his words, during the construction phase, the rent stabilized tenants lived in a dust bowl with every possible breach of warranty of habitability of our leases. Tenant of the management, excuse me, never offered any rent abatement, no apology, and in fact would be more than happy to continue harassing us so that we can leave. The, ma the management and other landlords who have exploited and gained the system should not be getting any rent increase whatsoever. Other tenants have seen their apartments illegally deregulated with little recourse available to them. Still others pay far over 3% of their income in rent with little to show for it. They deserve a rollback. I'll let another tenant offer closing remarks. New York City needs to prove that the city is not run by the real estate lobby, but is a city that supports its citizens. Uh, and I just wanted to add one other thing. Uh, our organization has a weatherization program that can help make buildings green and has lower costs for many buildings in our neighborhood. Uh, so it's it's very frustrating for me as a tenant advocate to hear that you know there's just nothing that landlords can do. There's many resources out there, and it's it should not be the tenant advocate's ability, uh, responsibility to bring those to landlords. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, Betsy. We've heard a lot about Airbnb in the last couple of hearings. Can you talk about what you, your organization is doing around Airbnb and what the tenant community is doing around Airbnb to 
stop this in, in New York City? Sure. Um, well, I, I first I have to say that the issue of long-term, mostly rent-regulated uh, apartments into hotels has predates the creation of Airbnb. Uh, tenants were coming to HCC about this in you know, 2005, 2006. Uh, our organization is located in Hell's Kitchen, which is obviously a very attractive area to tourists. Uh, but what you see is not what Airbnb touts, which is, oh, people use the service to supplement their rent or their mortgage. I work with several buildings where almost, almost the, the, the entire building is almost empty. There's just a couple of rent-stabilized tenants left. And they, of course, it's a loss of housing to the community, which we will really never get back, uh, despite you know having buildings, having a lot of construction in our neighborhood. And who's, um, that, that, who's putting those apartments up? It's, it's the landlords that do it. Uh, and in some buildings, it's continue, a continuation of, of warehousing units, of just keeping them uh, unrented for years. Um, but now they have even more incentive to not rent them to long-term tenants because they make a lot more money and it's a lot less work for them uh, to maintain the apartment. And in addition to the loss of housing, it's uh, there's been situations where there's been essentially kind of brothels in these apartments and you know tenants have no idea who has the keys. Um, and also the super and the other uh, people that are supposed to work with the tenants end up kind of spending much, spending much more time preparing the guest rooms and catering to them, uh, which results in a lot of harassment and lack of services for tenants. So you can tell about what you're doing legislatively, what you've done legislatively around Airbnb? Sure. Uh, well, in 2010, I believe uh, Gail Brewer, who was the city councilwoman at the time, now the borough president, uh, who's probably met almost everybody in this room. Uh -huh. She passed an illegal hotel law, which I, I don't know the kind of legal specifics of it, but it made it very clear that to rent out a unit for less than 30 days was um, against the rent civilization code, and landlords uh, or anyone who was found to be doing that would face uh, pretty high fines. Uh, and on kind of building on top of that, uh, a bill was recently passed in the House and the Senate through uh, Senator Rosenthal, who also represents uh, the Upper West Side and House Kitchen, uh, that made advertising a full unit um, uh, illegal and would also result in fines for, for doing that. And how many units do you think are being taken off the market by landlords for doing this? Do you have a, a guess on the line? Uh, I don't. I, I don't. Uh, but I know it's thousands. It's, it's, it's very, very visible in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren Bones. <laughs> Good evening, Ms. Williams. My name is Lauren Williams, and I have lived in the Linux Terrace Development in Harlem on 132nd Street between Linux Avenue and Fifth Avenue for 54 years. I am a member of the Linux Terrace Association of Concerned Tenants and a board member of Tenants and Ladies, a housing advocacy organization. I am championing for real rent roadmap. My son and my granddaughter were raised in the complex where we lived and it was expected they, they too would live and raise their families in the same community. But that is not the case. Because of escalating rents forged by loopholes in the rent laws, such as 20% vacancy bonus, preferential rents, MCIs, and IR, and compounded by the selection of tenants who they know will be short-term tenants, such as students, people doing hospital residency, and young single people who are not looking for long-term tenants. We have tenants whose families have been large, looking to transfer to a larger apartment, but cannot, due to the high rates, having to move across the river to New Jersey or to other states. Owners have been awarded their increases every year, but for the last year, when the birth for the very first time a rent fee was awarded, but only to one year leases, they still received a 2% increase on two year leases. However, let me remind this board that in 2010, the RGB increased all real estate apartments 
to a minimum monthly rent of one thousand dollars. And for me, and for a lot of tenants, that was a two hundred dollar increase per year. That's twenty five percent plus the two point two five percent increase for one year leases and four point five for two year leases. The following year, nine eleven happened, and the bottom fell out of the car. Jobs were lost. Businesses had to close. Millions of white collar workers have been stagnated in their jobs, not receiving salary increases in five to eight years. And for seniors receiving social security and pensions, they have remained black. Yet the hard company keeps awarding increases to owners that are not substantiated by financial proof of need. We want a real roadmap. We deserve a real roadmap. Thank you.